So, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, it's uh, original name of the of that was Beauty and the Beast, and I like this uh, Eta Lang, so Haskell for JVM. And uh, this is the Eta logo. Who has heard about Eta before this talk? So one person. So okay, it's for oh someone else. <laughs> okay, but uh, so there will be like explanation. What for? What is that? And everything. It's uh, it's for you. Uh, my name is Jarek Ratajski. Uh, Basically, I'm just an architect at Ingenious GmbH. It's a small company. We do stuff for banks and other bigger customers. And what is an architect is just, you know architects from Ivory Tower? You know? So if you fall down, you are an architect, basically. OK, but this is, this is like that. So the, like, what was the problem? What is, the, what's the, what's behind this talk? Why? Why am I even here? So the fact is that. I meet, and there are a lot of developers that actually do love Haskell. We, this is very nice, decent language. I will be showing you that, that too. Uh, anyone loves Haskell here? Raise your hands. So a couple of you, OK. For others, I will try to convince you for a little bit, even though it's not basically about Haskell. Um, however, and that's something I'm facing, when you go to the you know, normal customer, yeah, that's the typical message you get from either tower, like, Sorry, no Haskell, no nothing, just Java 6, and you, everything is perfect. OK, so there are some solutions for that. And this is, for instance, my solution I was doing for a long time. Let's try writing Haskell using Java. This looks, of course, beautiful, especially if you are nested in flat maps or flat maps somewhere. It's not even pure, it's, it's uh, from the Haskell perspective. And, but I, I, I try to do a lot of immutability with Java and try to be close to Haskell, and it just doesn't work well. OK. There is a better solution. Some smarter guys years before tried this. They tried to, uh, use, uh, to write Haskell using Scala. This is actual code from one of the uh, person I meet at conferences. This is like, uh, if, uh, who is you writing in Scala here? Let's write your hands. A couple of you, cool. That's at least way better, but still not exactly. So Haskell and Scala are languages that a little bit compete with each other, have both drawbacks and advantages. But it's uh, still, uh, some people, it's clearly visible. They write Haskell, Scala, but you would like to use Haskell. But this is the best solution. Yeah? Why not just write Haskell with Haskell? That is awesome idea. Why no one tried that before? OK. So the idea is, why do, can't we just compile it to the bytecode, then glue it with and if some existing Java libraries, and finally, we can deploy it to the web sphere? <laughs> of course, yeah. No, no, that was, doesn't have to be WebSphere, actually. Can be whatever. You remember, make jar, not war, and not ear, especially. So it still works. Uh, actually, but you can deploy ETA Haskell to WebSphere, no matter how crazy this sounds. Basically, wherever Java works, you can put it there. OK, wherever bytecode works. And now, why? Why would you even do that? Mm, I am one of the, this converted person that thinks that Haskell is a great language. Let me show you why for, for a moment. So a lot of you, if you see Haskell for the first time, you will be like saying, oh, this is looking like a Swahili. It's just not readable. It's actually, I came from Poland. And for years, I was thinking, I can't learn German. Life is just too short to learn that. It's very complex. Then I realized, you know, in Germany, there are small kids, and they talk German. What was surprising to me, how could they learn that such an easy language? And they even tell me that Polish is hard. And, uh, you know, this is exactly the problem. If you are coming from Java perspective, this might be hard for you. But if you come from Haskell, it's exactly opposite. The Java looks crazy. Can you imagine that? It's complex. And actually, ha syntax of Haskell is quite elegant in not that um, complicated. But you have to, use, to get used to that. But OK, I like this syntax, but it's just one thing. What is cool about Haskell is that we in Java use statements. In Haskell, we mostly have expressions. What is the difference? This is a statement in Java called switch statement. No, actually, there is an exception. I was just rating that uh, there is an error there, but don't worry about it. But there is a real error there. If I wanted to, let's say, calculate craziness level, you, who sees the re error here, the logical error? What's the problem? 
Yeah, it's uh, if the server is not web sphere, you have no return. Actually, okay, I never thought anyone would try that, you know, uh, application server that is not web sphere. But actually, there are such people, you know, they use Red Hat, JBoss, whatever. But this is a problem. We have function that is basically partial. It's not total. It's not defined for all uh, elements that could appear. And we Java won't help us with that. Java will would happily compile that and just go. What can help us, yeah, if our colleagues are very careful doing reviews, they will find the problem sometimes. Okay, but the point is, no one protested. Actually, Java can help you. But oh, what's happening? <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Sorry for that. Today? Oh. oh, hopefully. So I got you because actually, from today, there is a Java 12 available. And it partially solves this problem. You know that? Now you have an experimental feature of switch expressions. And now the compiler will tell you in Java that, yeah, there is, might be a problem. Actually, now it's coded correctly with some. But if you forget about it, you will get an error. This is so called Java finally after how many years? get to this point that switch is an expression, which is cool because you can instantly find more bugs. But the problem is we have always this still, uh, this old switch statement, and we have a lot of other statements. And we can't do anything with that for a moment. Uh, in Haskell, on the contrary, basically we don't have statements. Everything must be a correct expression and return a value. There are some, let's say, points we can discuss, but basically that's it. It's hard to not return a value. So. If you don't do it correctly, you will have, for instance, in that code, a warning which actually by default everyone makes a compilation error, that the pattern is not ex exhaustive and that we have to put some other, uh, state, uh, some, well, some other pattern here. Okay, that's one of the things, but this is just one of many polymorphism. This, there was today a talk about object-oriented programming versus functional, and one of the point is that in object-oriented programming we have polymorphism. Well, actually, if you try Haskell, you think that uh, Java doesn't have polymorphism, and, or at least it has very limited one. Uh, the point is, let's look at this. We want to serialize object to JSON. This is just an example of whatever you would do. This is just, I know that mostly we have annotations, whatever, that will do that for us, but just, that's just a typical case. So we create an interface, JSON serializable, with a method JSON to JSON. That's so awesome, so easy. Then we can have an object, that, uh, we create a class. All those instances of this class would have a method to JSON which we will implement. Probably very easy. I know that you typically don't do that, but you can implement interface. And there is everything fine with this picture. But what about from JSON? How to code from JSON serializable? If you try, you instantly see a problem, like how would that even look like from JSON? So that would be void. So first you have to create object, then you have to fill it with something. What about this object before you uh, take the data from JSON? It's kind of empty. Uh, it's instantly something is not cool here. Uh, it works, but it's not funny at all. And basically it's just totally wrong. It's, and there are, there are a lot of design patterns that actually help you to mitigate this problem in object-oriented world. Well, in Haskell we have this. Not only in Haskell. We create, for instance, some this. Actually, the, the, there is a class word there, which means a little bit different thing than in Java. From JSON A, where A is kind of like let's let's think about it like a generic parameter, and we say that classes that have that are from JSON have this method parse JSON from JSON to A, and then you can provide something called instance. It's like evidence that I know how to convert from JSON to person, and this is something called type class. And I, uh, of course, it also supports this classical polymorphism. So the, the example above is uh, showing how I would do that with a, a two JSON, which was never a problem for Java. But so what is a type class based polymorphism? 
It's a very simplified uh, definition, but you can think of it like it's a polymorphism on steroids that you don't only have polymorphic methods, you also have polymorphic static methods, which is so awesome, actually. Okay, and this is, so after you play with type classes, you find polymorphism in Java a little bit limiting. So that's, that's funny. Okay, purity. What's the purity? The real business example. I love this example. We sometimes do event sourcing. Who has, who has seen, heard about event sourcing? I know, every, it's like, you know, teenage sex. Like everybody talks about, no one has really do that, <laughs> done that, done this. But okay, uh, event sourcing and this, when you have event handler, we have this, like, uh, some kind of a method that takes existing state, sorry, and puts, uh, and then you, from existing state you apply an event and then you have a new state. Nothing problematic with that. But you have to be very careful because this event sourcing only works if after each time when you start from object, let's say initial object S empty and we apply list of events, that must end with exactly the same state. If you inside of this apply, you something like, which happens a lot, new date, or even in more crazy situation, random, or use some IO or network, this will totally break. You will, after re recreation of the object from the event sourcing, you will get something different. And how you prevent that in Java? Or in, even in Scala, whatever. You can't prevent people from doing that, especially if this new date is hidden somewhere in library below. You can't do anything about it. Maybe you will, someone will be careful during the review. But in Haskell, this disaster can be prevented. You have the, let's say, you create type class, I don't put it here, that has this signature. It means that I take a state and an event and have to create a new state. And anyone who is implementing this function can't do anything with IO, with date. You, you will see that. If you, uh, if you try to use, let's say, current date from uh, Haskell, it instantly puts you in some, something called IO monad. And you can get away from that in any way. Basically, you are stuck in that. And it means this function may only be pure. Of course, there is a style there, there are some tricks, but you have to do a lot of effort to, to make yourself a problem, actually. So the, uh, but normally, there will be uh, just no way to make it impure. And that would be fun. If you want to, but because sometimes we want, actually, to let developers do what they want. This is the way we can tell. Basically, IO means impure. Let's do whatever impure you want inside. Now you are able to. And we can exactly, as a, for instance, designer of a framework, a developer, we are able to tell what can be pure, what is impure. This is so awesome. No one needs to uh, spend time on review. Review is done by compiler. This is so cool. Typed. Also, uh, data modeling. Uh, this is a record. I just wanted to show you that. This is typical like, what you have like in Kotlin data class or case class in Scala. This is uh, same uh, easy in uh, Haskell. And you have it. Uh, by the way, because by default we have everything immutable in Haskell, what, what makes immutability very easy? Parallel processing. And what's, what does it mean for you? You can actually call, create multi-threading programs that use all your cores without even thinking about it. Actually, this is done via compiler automatically. You, you have a compiler option which tells how for how many cores automatically to parallelize the algorithms. You, you don't have to control that. Of course, you can do classical multi-threading and start the threads and whatever, but it is just, you know, compiler does some decisions for you. It's so cool, actually. Uh, and now, most important feature. After that, you would love instantly Haskell. This is like everyone in programming in Java waits for that. You have no semicolons. <laughs> it's like, come on, it's like you instantly switch after that. Yeah, I know that Kotlin has that, but it was 21 years before Kotlin and 14 years before Scala. Okay. So it's really cool. And of course, there are more features. I don't have time to really, to, it is not about how Haskell is cool. It is cool. Uh, at the end, because of this uh, very interesting and strict type system, you have less bugs. What's funny, you don't have to write so many tests because a lot of the things that you would test in Java here you don't have to provide any test because you can actually encode this test with type system. So, and even though uh, it's even more because testing functional code 
It's easy. You have a function, input and output. What can be problematic in testing that? So not only you have, you have to provide less tests, but even writing those tests, it's easier. This is so cool. And the, at the end, this is quite concise language. You don't have to write much code. It's, only, I would say, very opposite to Java. So you have less of everything. So it's so cool. And after some experiences with Haskell, this is what people, what you might think, like, oh, I would never write Java or Kotlin or, or even Scala in any place that is important for business. This is just mm, responsibility. Like, why would I make something with, on a, with a, such impure language that programming with is like a walking on a minefield? Like, no, no, we don't do that to ourselves. Okay. After you program a little bit more, you see, oh, yes, but. <laughs> There are some problems actually in Haskell as well. So, uh, for instance, we are used to great IDs. In Haskell, people nowadays still use Emacs, which is cool, but not cool for everybody. And uh, there is a plugin for IntelliJ, but it's nothing uh, close to what you have for Scala, Kotlin, or Java. Uh, however, this is not a, as big problem. Because, actually, the language is so small and so readable, actually, that you don't need so much help from ID. I can tell you, this is surprising for me, but initially you will be a little bit disappointed. The second is other tools, like we have build tools, uh, we have tools for checking quality, all that stuff. It is for Haskell, but it's nowhere close to what you have in Java. You, you have problem with, uh, uh, let's say, profiling a code, I don't even know. How would be that to, to do that on a real production system? Surely harder than with Java. Okay, and uh, but the, big, the biggest problem is in libraries. When I have to do something with Java, I need some functionality. I am Googling for library, and I find 40 of them. Oh, and instantly I find that, let's say, four of them are quite popular, well-documented, and good quality, and I, that's my choice, typically. In, I had the same, let's say, um, examples in Haskell. Well, I was finding four libraries instead of 40, and five of them in a really bad quality. Sometimes, really, it depends what you are doing. If you are doing something popular, it's easy. If you are doing something, let's say, interesting, that might be a disappointment. Uh, and this is the real uh, problem, and even more, we are not used to have, let's say, dependency hall in Java. We take a library from here, we take a library from there. Mostly there are no conflicts. In Haskell, we do have a conflict. Like this library would only work with version 2 of this and not version 3, but other would only work with 3, and you have a problem. And there, is a, there are even special tools to deal with that problems, but they are not perfect. Okay, and last but not least, it's like, kind of like with Java, this language evolved. And uh, it evolved in a way that we now have a lot of compiler extensions in Haskell. It means that compiler extensions that for each of the source file I can, I can decide which features I'm using and which not. Or sometimes uh, it means that in one source code I have 10 files and 10 of them can have different compiler options. That, so that I even copy paste the code from one file to another and it won't compile anymore. And sometimes it's a really tough decision what to do. Uh, and those compiler options beca come because yeah, the, lang the language was initially a little bit different than they were changing and changing by adding the features. At the end, it's a little bit of mess, sometimes. But the biggest problem is that, uh, that uh, I started with that. This is just a totally different way of thinking. If you are thinking in Java, you start with Haskell, then basically you have to unlearn Java a little bit. And this is really mind-melting problem. It is, if you do that with Haskell, probably you have to do the, the same. You have to unlearn the Haskell to understand Java, but you don't probably you don't have this problem. And this is something. Of, this is not a problem of Haskell. This is a problem of different paradigm. But it's something we can't ignore. There is, this is. If you go to do tomorrow to production with Haskell, probably half of your developer and team will die, or something because of that, get a cancer. I don't know. Might happen. You, you cannot uh, uh, ignore this problem. So, but what are the solutions? So, actually, business likes to do small steps. Maybe we can try Haskell, but don't, do not commit ourselves too much to that. So that we have a little bit of rescue in, the, in case we need it. So that's actually where ITA comes, Haskell on JVM. 
And yeah, this is the open source project, but designed by TypeLead, led by TypeLead. This is a company created for basically startup for that. Uh, and I'm not associated with TypeLead. Uh, uh, I even, this is a disclaimer, I basically, you have to uh, judge for yourself and check on your own. I don't want to make any harm to TypeLead whenever I criticize the solutions, whatever. I think they're doing a cool job, but I'm not associated and I might be wrong. I'm not even very decent Haskell developer. I'm very pathetic one. So I might, my, my opinion might not be perfect. If you want to do something productive with that, you have to check on your own. On the other hand, the company puts even my videos on the front page, so maybe don't, they are not really, let's say, offended by what I am saying. Okay, and important, this product is not yet fully finished. It's close, but it's not yet there, let's say, production ready officially. Uh, you, okay, but very quickly, this is what you see there above. This is the beauty of the Haskell. For instance, how is a quicksort implemented? And this is standard Haskell code that you have on the first lessons. So quicksort is we take one element that we put in the middle. All the elements on the left world are those that are smaller. All elements on the right are those that are bigger. We have the special syntax there above. Okay, oh, doesn't work. Uh, X uh, uh, colon XS, which means this is a list which where X is head, XS is a tail. This is standard, let's say, uh, uh, the construction pattern in programming language, but this all, after a while, is very readable, actually. And this is it's all, all, almost like a pseudocode that you would write how a quick source actually should work. Uh, there is a star behind that. That's not a real quick source, but who knows about it? Okay, there is, oh, you know. What's the problem? <laughs> okay, there is a small problem, but I will cover it later. But it's, let's say, good enough, and it works. It works cool. This is how to run it. So you see that you have ITA compiler, which is called ITA, no surprise, which takes HS, it is a standard Haskell file, creates a jar for you, then you run this jar, fine, done. This is cool and easy. Uh, the real life is more complex. It's like, ITA is like Java C for Java, and you know that no one actually uses Java C. Come on, who compiles with Java C? We use, uh, we use of course, IDE, but without IDE, you use Maven. So something that corresponds to Maven or Gradle or whatever, SBT, is ITLAS. This is basically a build tool for ITA. And what is important is actually compliant to the uh, build tool for Haskell called Cabal, which uses the same file format. It accepts the same file. So if someone is coming from the Haskell world, he almost ha he has, doesn't have to do big adaptation to just compile his Haskell code with libraries to work with ITA. This is so cool. He just has to change the name of the compiler and, and build tool. Uh, if you want to know more, you go to this etalang page, and there is a tour, let's say, tutorial. This is a great, quite great done. It shows you the most important features so that you can start tomorrow program. So what makes ETA special? special? Why people can be interested in that? Uh, in this implementation, because this is not the only one, actually, for Haskell for JVM. Because ETA is actually GHC port for a JVM. GHC is like industry standard Haskell. It's like we in Java have Oracle Java and all others. Like, okay, Open JDK is still close to Oracle. All others. We, we, we look, at, if we are thinking about Java, we are talking about Oracle Java, let's say. The same for Haskell. There are many implementations of Haskell, but if, you, if someone is talking, I'm programming Haskell, probably he means I'm programming with GHC, Glasgow Haskell Compiler. So, uh, Glasgow Haskell Compiler works in two stages. First, it takes your sources and creates some intermediate form, which is not bytecode, as in Java. In this intermediate form in, in Java would be bytecode. Here it's something called STG. And this is how STG looks like. It's a text file. And let's say this is the minimal functional language that can be, let's say. This is like mathematical creation. But the idea is that we just take, possibly we can have multiple other languages that compile to STG. And then we have second step where STG is compiled to native code. Uh, here we have a different thing. We compiled normal Haskell to STG in a first step with ETA. Uh, this STG is something like this. This is just a language, let's say, but very, very minimal. And uh, it's like a bytecode. In first step of this compilation in ETA and GHC, this is the, basically the same code with very small adaptation. It's just a fork. And that makes ETA very compatible with GHC. 
But then there is a second step where normal Haskell compiles STG to native code. Here you have compilation to bytecode JVM. That's, that's all what's important about the internal. So that's, for instance, code created by uh, this uh, bytecode created by this compiler. OK. So uh, important part is that Haskell from initially was always supporting the C imports. In, inside of the Haskell code, you, can re you could refer to C libraries exactly as in Java you could refer to native libraries. There is just different naming for that foreign function interface. And you see example from the standard uh, GHC. Uh, let's say float HS is like float class in Java. Basically co covers operation on floats. And you have the same in Haskell, uh, which is nice. And most of those operations are primitives done with actually standard library in C. So they are, in fact, delegated to the C code. And in case of ETA, what they did, they took those sources, like from Java runtime sources, but this time from Haskell runtime, let's say base sources, they're called base, and they have written all the C codes to corresponding similar Java. Uh, actually, you see that Java lang float is none, is corresponding to some is none from, from C. So this was a quite automatic job. They did that. At this moment, we are basically, we, we have it. OK, sorry, just my, uh, it doesn't work. Oh. OK, whoa, 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 where is this gone? Sorry for that. Hopefully it would work. OK, and the bigger problem, hackage. We have in Java Maven. And in Maven, we have all those nice libraries, everything. In Haskell, the corresponding thing for that is hackage, so the repository of libraries. And it would be fun, it would be working without the problem with ETA if some of them were not actually having native code in C. So what they do actually is they uh, native code in foreign function interface, they handle with something called patches. They have a special project where they patch all those all those base libraries with uh, places with C with corresponding Java code. That's how it looks like. OK. Uh, this is, I don't like this method, but it's actually working. It's just pragmatic. Uh, I, and I am surprised how, uh, basically, I'm taking some example projects in Haskell that use the libraries and never so far had a bigger problem. There was one time once that where I needed something called Unix library, which was not fully patched. But, uh, it, will, it had some more sophisticated I.O. functions on files. OK. Uh, uh, it also means that it's very important. I told you that uh, real Haskell means a lot of compiler extensions. They look like that. And all of them are just supported in ETA. There is no magic in that, because this is just a fork. OK. So now we come to the interesting point. Uh, what about performance? And this is interesting, because Basic optimization, if you, if you ever have a, hear about op, in creating compiler for functional language, the thing number one is tail call optimization. Who knows this? So this is, you know, who knows recursion? OK, you know, all know recursion. You know that recursion is a problem for stack. The problem is that in functional languages, we all use formally a stack a lot. So we would have only stack overflow exceptions if we just look at those, ex, those solutions. To mitigate that, there is something called TCO. It basically, whenever the recursive call is done at the end of the function, we can replace this whole construct with while loop. And when, if you hear on the network about TCO on JVM, you will get, uh, let's, OK, let's, let's go one step. This is like naive Fibonacci. Fibonacci, we have two recursive calls. And this is basically, you can't rescue that. You can't fix that. It will be problematic for bigger n. But there is an alternative, a little bit better, not the best version of Fibonacci, which does, does tail call optimization, which is actually in normal Haskell, you will have tail call optimization in a GHC. Uh, so the thing is that you would hear, sorry, JVM doesn't support TCO. I've heard it many times. Yes, but uh, assembly, where normal Haskell works, doesn't support either. Yeah, but somehow it works. How? Because this is not our problem. When assembly is creating while loop, why can't we create while loop in bytecode? We'll see that. So that it would be a corresponding code in Java, Fibonacci. And of course, in Java, we, have, we don't have TCO. So how many n 
for how big ends do you think I can calculate that? Who knows? Mm, actually, <laughs> it depends, but bigger. Actually, this on the standard JVM uh, 8, let's say, whatever, if you run it, you will get to 10,000, more or less, but it depends on the stack size, which you can make bigger. But it's also a number, but you are still limited. Uh, if you do the same with ETA, the question is how much can you calculate with ETA? Who knows? The number. No numbers? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Actually, the <laughs> no, because the number memory is limited. But I tried it for a million. I tried it for 10 millions. And it took a lot of time to calculate. But finally, it finished. Uh, I will just show you the end of this. I have this console. And, uh, you, you know, this is 10 million. So <laughs> it took <laughs> like two hours, probably. I don't know. Maybe shorter. I was doing other stuff. But basically, it, was, it's, uh, it finished. And it didn't complain. So you see it's working. And this is not a surprise, because if you go to the bytecode generated, you can do that always. And you will see this. This is a while loop there instead of, a no instead of the normal code. It is just this whole, this is the compiler is smart enough to do a while loop for you. This is nothing special for functional languages. And JVM doesn't support that. Come on, JVM supports while loop. So we are done. Uh, OK. Uh, by the way, this code above, I tried it two years ago. It didn't work. Uh, <laughs> that was really a uh, disappointment. I, I raised an issue on a GitHub and told, oh, I wanted to present ETA. But it didn't work. And uh, there was a bug in there. And funny thing now, the developer, main developer of ETA um, somehow forced me to fix this bug on my own. The problem in that is two years ago, I wasn't really great. That was it a year ago. I don't know. I wasn't really good Haskell developer at that time. I could do some small puzzles like, you know, weeks or whatever. But monads and everything was complicated for me. Uh, but you know, I, I was able, this language is so readable. I was able actually to fix this bug in a compiler while learning Haskell. And it's, it was nothing really. Uh, at the beginning, I was scared a little bit, the first night. But then, you know, uh, this, is, this is actual fix somewhere. And the developer of ETA actually was helping me. So it's partially his job. But he was able to explain me how Haskell work in a couple of hours. And to the point that I was able to fix this and a couple of other small compiler errors, let's say, mostly with performance. So this is cool, and it shows, because at that same time, I was trying to do a bug, uh, bug fix for Kotlin, which is mostly written in Java, and I know Kotlin. I failed. I couldn't find the places in the compiler. It was too complex. This, is, this shows me something about the languages. Actually, this is the moment I fell off in Haskell totally. But OK, now about this is one thing we see. It's done, and it's like basic feature you have to do. What more about performance can we say? So uh, you, who knows JMH? If you ever do benchmarks on JVM, first go and check what JMH is. Otherwise, your all benchmarks are wrong. If you do it with JMH, your benchmarks are wrong, but less wrong. Uh, but this is really important. OK. So what I try to do is compare a couple of, let's say, quick sort implementations. And uh, this is not a professional benchmark. Check it on your own. I didn't have much time to do professional benchmark. It is wrong, but it's not totally wrong, I hope. So let's say naive quicksort, shown as above. And the same thing with Java, with Wave library, which is basically trying to present you immutable lists. Who, who is using Wave in Java? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. This library number one, if you are doing professional Java for a business code, never ever use Java util. I, I, util, I tell you, for collections, because mutable collections are the source of a lot of problems. If you switch to Wave, you will never want to switch back. This is one step you can do for Java for, to make your life easier, actually. So this is with Wave, and it's the, both codes, you see Java is a little bit longer, but both uh, parts are doing the same. Uh, and this is a real quick sort in Haskell, because real quick sort is making the changes in place. So that's a, so the, the quick, quick sort before is what wasn't guarantee, guaranteeing that we change the array in place. Here is the real quick sort, which you see is not as nice as before, but still interesting, let's say. 
and we'll compare it with, well, let's say, with a real quick, quick sort. Actually, behind least sort in Java is not a quick sort, but some form of merge sort, but let's compare it with that. Benchmark that tries to be, let's say, honest, always have sources, so sources out there. You can check where, where are the errors. But now the results, this is more or less what I got. I don't, this is not professional, so those are really only showing more or less. But you see that eta, in turn, for instance, for naive quick sort, it's, a, let's say, well, more than twice as slow. Okay, this is bad. But for a real quick sort, let's say, it's, not, it's better than, let's say, more or less 60% of the speed. For business solutions, and I'm, when I'm thinking about using Haskell, it's mostly for business code. This is not a big deal. This is something you can sacrifice this performance if you know that your code will never break. Okay, I will, will break lace. It is something you can do, you can think of. So already at this moment, if this was an average case, let's say 60%, we could think about it. Basically, I would tell you that I'm thinking that language is not ready to replace some, something else if the performance is like 10% of something, because then you would really see that in productive code. This is something you probably shouldn't see, because the, your program is mostly slow on uh, asking something from network or database, not of using some CPU, like here. Depends, but mostly. Okay, now comparison versus other Haskells, because I told you that there are other Haskell solutions out there, and this is something called standard 12 queen solution. I use this because it was used as a, one of the bugs uh, on the list of ETA, because initially it was very bad performance, but these are more or less recent uh, resolutions. So, so if we use something called Frege, this is old Haskell uh, uh, for JVM, it appeared to be uh, a little bit, okay, twice as slow as ETA. Maybe I did something wrong for Frege, I don't know. If there is someone here with Frege experience that can tell me what can I fix there, that would be interesting. But what it shows that ETA is, at, is uh, right now at least comparable with uh, Frege, it's actually now better. Previously, before that, before one of the bug fixes, it was like five minutes here, really something crazy. But now it's just there. And we can compile it with a native Haskell, GHC, which uh, could compare it, and we will see that this is at 10 seconds. And by the way, this was measured with this uh, CPU time tool, which took into consideration startup of JVM and everything, so it was very unfair for both Frag and ETA in comparison to GHC, but still, okay, let's say twice as slow, it's not as bad. It's still acceptable even if you compare with a native GHC, which is already very mature. The A lot of the optimizations are there. It also shows that a lot of optimizations we also have on the JVM, which is the point. So there are other benchmarks, but more or less the, they show that this is already a quite valid solution. Uh, now I have to really go quickly. How it looks if we have, want to make, uh, mix uh, Java with Haskell in one source? It's possible. For instance, this way we can import Java type like jcolor to our, let's say, class uh, in data, actually, uh, in, in data type in, in Haskell. We can call, this way we can import JVM function from any library, this can be our function, to Haskell, like a method, etc. By the way, whenever you do that, you actually you see that this Java there means this is a monad. Monad means, let's say in this context, impure. So whenever you call Java code, the assumption is this is impure code. This has, uh, so it means, for instance, inside of this pure method, like state application, you cannot by default use Java. Okay, there are ways to solve that. You can, let's say, promise the compiler that actually the, this Java function is pure. And then you can do all, all the nasty stuff there, but it, then, it, then it's your choice. But okay, let's go. Uh, we can also from Haskell export a function that will be used in Java. That's not a problem. Uh, there are three styles of interoperability I, uh, I tried. One of them is really cool. It's called with servlet. Because what is a servlet? This is a function that takes request and returns response. That's so cool. So let's just delegate directly this function to Haskell. You just, there is something, a wrapper, which basically does it for you. So you write all your server with Haskell, and then you put this wrapper, and only it calls your functions and delegates them. And then you put it, it as a var, a var file uh, to Tomcat, WebSQL, whatever you want. This is just, let's, let's ignore as much of Java as we want, but some architects want us to put things on Tomcat or WebSphere. We are done. Other style is, let's say, uh, 
we have classes in Java, but logic, the real, let's say data types in Java, but the logic in Haskell. This is also something I tried. I did this, let's say, uh, whenever I'm trying something new, I'm trying to implement Pong, because I, I, I say that if Pong was implemented in the 70s, if I can implement something with Pong, uh, this Pong with some, let's say, tool, it means it's at least good enough for 70s. You know, I tried it well once with JSF, and it didn't work. So I, mean, I tell you that JSF is not ready for 70s. Okay. But nevertheless, this is, for instance, uh, how the Java code look like, and uh, this is how I used the, let's say, this is now logic written in Haskell operating on Java object. It wasn't nice. I had to do a lot of imports. Now there is a tool that uh, makes it easier for you, but still it's a little bit nasty, but works. Uh, while doing that, I found something really interesting. Uh, this is like, there's always this discussion that uh, Inuits, they have uh, like 400 ways of describing a snow. You know that? And you can't talk to them about the snow because you are too limited in your language. Actually, the truth is probably, but we don't know those 400s. Uh, they are never printed. The thing is, though, both of, uh, all of them are not really polite. If you are live, spend your life in snow, you don't have a polite words for that. So, but anyhow, this shows you something that there's a, the problem, impedance between languages and uh, some things you cannot see in one language if you think in one language. I had these two methods. Basically, there is one method above and very similar, like mirror of this method, but with some different variables below. And I, I put a comment, I remember that, because that was my check if Java is ready for 70s, that those methods look very similar. I have to unify them into one, but I never have found a time and a smart way to do that. While I was replacing that with Haskell code, instantly I realized, oh, this is the place for lenses. And I've heard about lenses before. I never found what, is the, what the hell are lenses. That's not important here. It's like Monat, other fancy word they use in Haskell. But you never know what's this. And you can't imagine that if you are thinking in Java. But after that, when, when I was doing that in Haskell, instantly I realized, oh, this is the place where I have to use that. You know what is now funny? This method would also work in Java. Although I have never found time to do that, but this way now I can know how to write better this code in Java after lesson in Haskell. Yeah, well, this is interesting. Well, however, I also found something that my Java, my Haskell looks still similar to Java. This is typical that you you start writing in Haskell after years of Java, and this is what actually you are doing. It's called Java uh, because it's really smelling still. And okay, and now the last way, which I really find cool. If you actually model your domain fully in Haskell, you model your logic in Haskell, and Java is only a controller for that. It's just a small thing that lets, uh, does this user interface or whatever. And this also works. Uh, uh, basically, we can have something like object reference, which behind hide, hides any Java Haskell code. And maybe I will show you something I did with that. Just a moment. You like. Let me, I'm starting a code. Uh, this is something I called, uh, really, it, I put on the, uh, on the, oh, it was so fast. This is game of life, if you don't know it. Really funny thing. And I modeled it totally with Haskell, but then I put the results, which are, let's say, array in Haskell uh, with JavaFX on, on GUI. This is, uh, I would say, the most funny way of working and cooperating with Haskell. Uh, and yes, OK. So just a moment. I'm there. So problems that I found while doing that kind of exercises, uh, that imports, yeah, I had to use a lot of imports. That was, let's say, tedious job. But now there is something called FFI tool, which helps with that. So you basically, you take a long list of classes, and automatically imports for Haskell are generated for you. I found some other bugs, but uh, I've become I was fixing them in ETA, which was funny. That was a year ago, That's, so now this language is more mature. And uh, for instance, working with Monas instantly at the beginning is crazy, but then you learn it and you find them cool. OK, so now comparison maybe ETA versus Frege. I would, let's say this is a list, but my personal feeling is that ETA is more professional. If you're coming from a Haskell background, you should look at ETA, because your existing Haskell code would mostly compile, and the code you find in Google would mostly compile. 
you can use all the libraries and everything. But the cooperation with Java sometimes will be not very efficient. You will have to write this imports, everything. Uh, on the other hand, and still this is version 0 0.8. Uh, Frege is really mature. I don't know which version they have, but it has a longer story. If you are coming from Java and only want to experiment a little, maybe that's a better solution at the beginning. It's hard to say. I didn't invest much time with Frege, but maybe it's like this. Uh, but the, uh, that's the point. I already had, uh, I met actually the people that had a longer Haskell, let's say, rules and business logic written in Haskell, and they were forced by architect to, architects to rewrite it to Scala or Java, to whatever, to JVM. They are in love with this uh, ETA tool. I don't know if any one of them has used that in production already. I don't have uh, any, uh, let's say, connections. But maybe it's, it's just an interesting solution. So for you, let's say we are going to the, to the end. Uh, this is the recent version of ETA. It's still not something like 1.0. And more or less, I would say it shows the quality. Mostly everything works, but sometimes there are surprises. And there are some issues still. Uh, uh, for if you are going to production, thinking about production, you are desperate because you don't want to rewrite your Haskell, let's say, like those guys. You have to talk to type lead. I can't, tell, I can't really tell you anything sensible here because maybe they will already cover you with something. I don't know. That's their business. But if you are a Haskell developer that wants to evaluate JVM, you want to see how cool it is, this is actually, you can try it now. You are mostly not Haskell developers. You are Java developers. So it's the easy way for you to play with that. Because you can even do a small module in Haskell and don't commit yourself fully to Haskell and you can even make it working. You can, do, in Haskell, re refer to your existing Java libraries so you don't have to really learn a whole new world. This is cool. You can play, play now. This is this fun. And about ETA community, actually, I tried to show you. This is a small community, but it's very active. They have a Gitter. If you put an, actually, yesterday, before this talk, I put small problem. And in the, in the middle of the night, I got response already, even though I solved this problem. But they really are um, responding to anyone with problems, and they're trying to help. So they are really great. And yeah, there are a lot of issues that actually if you are thinking about learning Haskell, you can do something which is actually sensible. Instead of doing next, you know, to do or hello world, you can fix something for ETA. It's not really that hard. They have a lot of low hanging fruits there. For instance, this FFI tool, it's the, you don't even have to write everything in Haskell. You can do partially in Java or whatever you want, uh, if it's JVM. So, one message to you at the end. That was my lesson, and that's the lesson that everybody is basically telling. If you learn some completely new way of thinking, like in this case, Haskell, you not only learn Haskell, but you improve your Java skill. Now I know how to improve some of my codes using the same way of thinking that I use in Haskell, even though it's a completely different world. And that's my final message. Uh, maybe you will understand finally what this M word, you know what I'm talking about, means. Who knows what I'm talking about? Uh, what is this? Yeah, monad. In Java, we have monads, but you only see they, why are they really needed in a pure language? In, in Scala, they work perfectly, but you don't see, for instance, why IO monad is needed at all. You, I don't see that in Scala. In Haskell, you, you can try what would be without, and now you see. OK, that's all. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for questions? Okay, if anyone has questions, oh, I'm always available after that, so you're welcome. Okay.